This is my most recent addition to my vintage video camera collection. I've got quite a few things in there I'd like to show you, but this one pushed itself right to the top of my list. It's a 1984 RCA CKC021 color video tube camera, which doesn't matter because we're not going to look at it and we're not going to look at its picture. We're going to look at its viewfinder. If we take a look in here, you'll notice right away that it's in color. And some people watching this get why that's a big deal and are freaking out, and others have no idea why that's special. It's understandable, color viewfinders are very common nowadays. Here's a 1993 Sony Handycam with a color viewfinder. You could tell because it was still such a selling point, they printed it right on the outside. If we take a look at this one, you'll see it's got uh, quite a nice picture, nice color rendition. But that's because it's based on mature LCD technology. By 1993, you could make a color LCD and put it in just about anything, and these became very popular. In the 80s, however, color LCDs weren't really a thing you could have. The first full color consumer LCD that I'm aware of came out the same year that this thing did in a little pocket television. So the technology was brand new at that point. So what they had instead in camcorders were cathode ray tubes. This one has one, let me show it to you. This one was made by Hitachi, who incidentally probably made that one and just rebranded it for RCA. You can see the picture from this one is also color, but if we take a look in the viewfinder on the back, you'll see that the image is black and white. That's because this is the face of a little black and white cathode ray tube, pretty much like the one that's in here. You know, the big heavy glass things that we used to have to haul up and down into our apartments before flat screens finally came down in price. It's a tube about probably yay long, goes back here and then there's the end with the pins and the wires go off wherever and there's the high voltage circuitry and the flyback transformer and everything, all packed into the camcorder body. Of course with this sort you were just supposed to look straight into the back of it, so that put the CRT comfortably inside the camera's body. Uh, there was another, perhaps more common variety that you might be more familiar with. For cameras that could go on your shoulder, they would put the CRT out here on the outside of the camera, uh, initially in these little outboard pods like this where the tube sticks out way behind the eye cup, uh, but later they refined that. This here is a 2001 professional studio camera, and this has pretty much the end point of this technology. Uh, this is also a CRT viewfinder, but the CRT is uh, up inside of here instead of hanging around outside the camera. There's a 45 degree mirror in this box here, so you look in and your vision is reflected into the face of the screen, which is right about here. So obviously this uh, makes it much more compact. You can put this on your shoulder, look into the eye cup, but the CRT itself isn't hanging around outside the camera. It's safely tucked away over here. I can show you real quick on this one what this technology looks like. So by 2001, this is what the insides of these things looked like. And you see the tube itself is very diminutive. Actually, a good chunk of it is up here. This is where the part that flares out and contains the phosphor screen is. It's up inside this little neck here. The anode connection is also hidden up in that bell. That's what that white wire there is. And then you've got your magnetic yokes here. And then at the back, you've got your cathodes. And then all the high voltage circuitry, the flyback and everything are all tucked in here. It's a very compact little package. But let's plug this back in and see what it looked like in 2001. So if we take a look in here, you'll see that the uh, viewfinder image is still black and white. It's uh, a very nice, very crisp, nicely contrasty black and white, but it's still just black and white. Now this was a very expensive, very high-end camera when it came out. This was sold for tens of thousands of dollars about 40 to 50 years after color television hit the market. So why is this viewfinder still in black and white? Well, I can only speculate on this part because I didn't find any supporting documentation, but I think the reason is just that making color CRTs this small is incredibly difficult. The technology that goes into making a color CRT is extremely complicated compared to a black and white CRT. The principles behind the black and white CRT are actually pretty straightforward. There's lots of videos that'll explain basics of CRT technology, but let me just give you the cliff notes. With your basic black and white CRT, it's very straightforward. You've got a phosphor screen at the front, you have an electron gun or cathode at the back. When you apply voltage to it, electrons shoot forward, hit the phosphor, and produce light. There are magnetic yokes, electromagnetic coils, wrapped around the tube. One makes the beam go up, down, one makes it go left and right, and by steering that around, it can sweep the beam across the screen. By adjusting the voltage at the cathode to produce more or less electrons, you can make more or less light on the screen, and by sweeping the beam across the screen rapidly while doing so, you can produce a picture. The color tube does exactly the same thing, but it does it three times at once. There's three cathodes at the back producing three electron streams, and there's three colors of phosphor on the front, red, green, and blue. However, what it doesn't do three times is it doesn't sweep the beams three times. It sweeps them all just once across the screen. Now the reason for that is that as the beams travel across the screen, they have to illuminate each of the three colors of phosphor in each of the color triplets, the red, green, and blue, with the appropriate intensity for that component of the picture at that specific location. 
You could try to do this with one gun, but they just can't get them fast enough. As the beam swept across the screen, it would have to rapidly change intensity to match whichever color phosphor it was over at any given moment. In a black and white television, this doesn't matter so much. As the beam sweeps across the screen, there might be microscopic differences in exactly where it hits the screen. It might not be in perfect synchronization, but that doesn't matter because your eyes can't make that out. However, in a color tube, the different colored phosphors are so close together that if the beam isn't in exactly the right spot when it switches from the red channel to the green channel and so on, it's going to shift color as it moves across the screen. So to solve this problem, they use a thing called a shadow mask, which is a metal sheet with a bunch of little tiny holes punched in it. And as the three electron beams sweep across the screen, all three are continuously outputting their color channel. The red gun is doing the red, the green doing the green, and the blue doing the blue. But when they get to the screen, the shadow mask prevents each gun from being able to hit the color phosphors that aren't intended for it. So when the red gun tries to shoot the green phosphor, it hits the shadow mask instead, and so on for the other colors. This ensures that each one can only reach its color, so they don't need to know where they are on the screen. They can just blindly blaze across the screen, shooting out the image without thinking about where they are, and they'll all end up in the right spot. There's a variant of this called Aperture Grill, or Trinitron, Sony's name for it, but it's exactly the same thing. It uses a differently shaped shadow mask, and it uses strips instead of dots of phosphor, but it's otherwise exactly the same principle. Okay, that was the quickest possible explanation I could do. Taking all of that, the three guns, the three color phosphors, the shadow mask, and putting it all into a tube that's only this big, I think might just be beyond our manufacturing capability, at least in the era when this was made. I've never seen anyone pull it off other than the Panasonic CT101, which came out the same year this thing did, and I think it's still quite a bit larger than this. I think it's like an inch and a half or something like that. So color CRTs just never made it into camera viewfinders, except this one. This isn't an early LCD. It's not some sort of field sequential color wheel contraption or something. This is a single gun color CRT. I can prove this. I happen to have two of these viewfinders. Uh, this one is broken. It came off of a Hitachi model of the exact same camera. You can see these are definitely exactly the same unit. I'll just open this up here. You can see that although it's much larger than the last one I opened up, uh, all the same parts are here. Um, here's the tube. It's bigger than the other one only because it's older. Uh, these are the uh, magnetic yokes. There's the phosphor screen. Uh, this is all the control circuitry. There's a little tiny flyback transformer hidden. You can barely see it, but it's in there. So this is also a cathode ray tube. And there's the mirror I was mentioning, which uh, bounces the image from the front of the screen out through the eyepiece. Now I can't prove from showing you the innards of this thing that it only has one electron gun, but I can prove that it's a very unusual type of CRT. If we look up here in the mirror box, you'll see in the bottom, there's this odd thing. There appears to be a couple of little lenses there and a couple of little filters. So what's all that about? Well, let me button this thing back up and I'll show you what those do. Okay, if we take a look back in the viewfinder here, uh, and then I just stick my finger in there and block one of those lenses, you see the color starts to go away. If I stick my finger all the way in, it's gone completely. There's pretty much no color in there. This is weird moiré effect, but that's it. Take my finger away, and the color all comes back. What black magic is this? Well, I'm not gonna keep you in suspense any longer. This is a thing called a beam index color picture tube. It's also known as Indextron. That's Sony's trademark for it, of course. It's able to produce color in a conventional-esque picture tube using no shadow mask and only one gun, using a system of closed loop feedback. Essentially, they managed to make a color picture tube which has no more parts in it than this black and white picture tube. The way they pulled that off is by eliminating an entire factor from the equation, which is the need for precision timing. As I said, if you want to use a single gun, then the circuitry in the TV has to know where the electron beam is at all times, down to within one phosphor stripe of its current location. If it gets it wrong, if it's off by even a little tiny bit, just a couple of nanoseconds, then it's going to start spilling color into the wrong phosphors. Now normally the way you'd have to do this is when you send that electron beam flying across the screen, you'd have to have a piece of circuitry that's able to keep track of where that beam is by just guessing really, really well, because the beam doesn't give any feedback on where it is. By adding a system to obtain that feedback, you can remove all the dead reckoning from the equation, and that's exactly what this tube does. In order to get that feedback, they take the normal phosphor stripe order of red, green, blue, and they introduce two new colors. The first one is an ultraviolet phosphor, which comes before the red in each color triplet. The second one is a different color green that's in the middle of the normal color green, if I'm understanding it correctly. It wasn't super clear from what I read. I went through some patents and I read some other people's documentation on this, and it was all very confusing. But apparently there's like a special green that they have in the middle of the normal green. That hump in the bottom of the mirror box has two photo sensors in it, and those sensors have lenses on them that filter them to only receive ultraviolet light in one and that special color green in the other. 
Now, as the beam sweeps across the screen, every time it hits an ultraviolet strip of phosphor, it produces a pulse in the ultraviolet photosensor. And every time it hits that special green, it produces a pulse in the green photosensor. Those two pulses are what you'd typically call in electrical engineering a clock signal. They tell the circuitry how fast the beam is moving and when it reaches certain points. Every time the circuitry detects a pulse from the ultraviolet photosensor, it knows the beam just crossed into an ultraviolet phosphor and is about to go into a red one, so it can start outputting the red component of the color signal. Then as the beam passes into the green phosphor, it produces a pulse in the green photosensor. And I believe this basically causes the circuitry to resonate at the frequency of the beam passing through the phosphors. With the circuitry knowing when the beam is going into a red phosphor and knowing how long it takes for it to get to a green phosphor, it's able to pretty much know how quickly to cycle through the colors as the beam goes across the screen in order to land every color where it belongs. And that's pretty much it. It's not actually a very complicated system. It kind of makes you wonder why they never thought to do it before. Well, apparently they did think to do it before. They thought to do it in the 60s and it didn't work. They kept trying and trying and trying to get it into a finalized product. But as far as I know, they never got it into any consumer products other than this thing, a little tiny portable television that Sony made, and a big honking projector that Sony made with a Betamax deck in it. And other than that, this never really made its way into anything, and I'm not super sure why. Probably, I would guess, because the actual need for small color tubes was not really that big a deal, and in larger tubes, they had just figured out how to make Aperture grill really well, so TVs looked pretty good by the time anybody had figured out how to make this work, and no one really needed to put in the extra effort of adding these extra semiconductors and this complex timing circuitry. I could be wrong, but at any rate, it never happened, so it's moot. And hey, who cares, because it also doesn't work very well. If you compare the quality of this viewfinder to the quality of the one in the 1993 LCD camera, it looks a lot better in the LCD camera. This kind of looks like crap. It's one of those technologies where they pulled off this incredible feat of engineering, producing a device that no one actually wanted to use because it still sucked. It's incredible that it can do it, but it still doesn't do a very good job of it. So more than anything, it's just a curiosity. If you're familiar with CRTs and are impressed by one that's able to pull off the seemingly impossible, then this thing is neat. But otherwise, yeah, it's not really much to write home about. There is, however, one remarkable side effect of this system, which no other CRT could claim, and I find very impressive, although it's uh, kind of hard to demonstrate. This is a magnetic retriever tool, and you probably know that you shouldn't hold magnets near CRTs. Um, now, that advice is a little nuanced. See, if I put this magnet up against this black and white television, you can wave it around and, you know, it kind of messes it up, but when you pull it away, it goes away. There's no lasting damage. If we do the same thing with the color tube, though, it distorts the colors horribly. And when we pull it away, they stay distorted. Puts this big, ugly bruise on here, and it'll just stay there indefinitely, at least until we hit the degauss button. Now, the reason this happens is because in the black and white television, when you put the magnet up there, the electrons start bending around the magnetic field, but as soon as you pull it away, they go back to normal. They strike where they're supposed to. There's nothing to retain the magnetic field. In the color television, however, the aperture grill in this case, or the shadow mask if it was that style, is made out of a ferrous material. That means it can hold a magnetic charge or a flux state. So when I put the magnet up there, it distorts the electron beam. And since those electrons are being distorted after they get past the shadow mask or aperture grill, they continue to get distorted on their way to the screen, which allows them to hit the wrong phosphors. That's why we see red turn into green and green turn into purple and so on, because it's shifting them from their appropriate phosphors over to the color next to them. And then when I pull the magnet away, it leaves an imposed magnetic flux on the shadow mask or aperture grill. In other words, it turns the aperture grill, in this case, into a tiny permanent magnet. So even though my magnet is gone, I've magnetized part of the television. And now when the electrons are streaming towards the screen, when they pass the aperture grill, they get deflected by the grill itself. When you press the degauss button on the TV, it corrects this by generating an alternating magnetic field that essentially resets or neutralizes the magnetism of all the metal near the front of the screen. Now let's do it to this one. I'll admit, it's kind of harrowing putting a powerful magnet next to a, an incredibly rare and priceless... not priceless, but still pretty rare and special tube. I mean, what if I damage it, right? But I'm gonna go ahead and do it. Okay, so here we are, and now I'm gonna take the magnet and put it right up near the face, and you can see that it bends the heck out of the picture. And it does distort the colors. But then when I pull it away, everything just goes back to normal. The colors don't stay distorted. Now the reason for that is that there's no shadow mask and there's no aperture grill. There's nothing to retain the magnetic flux. So as soon as I pull the magnet away, the colors all steer right back to where they belonged and there's no persistent magnetic field to continue distorting them. I know it's less punchy than if I could put this straight up against the screen. It's just really hard to get in there without damaging it. 
The other thing that's kind of hard to make out on the cell phone video, it, it shows up a lot better to the human eye, is that although the colors do distort, they're not actually changing hue like they are on this one. The greens aren't necessarily shifting into reds and so on. It's sort of an optical illusion. When you look at it with your eye, they actually stay the same. They just start to lose saturation as the magnet gets closer. That was actually a selling point of these CRTs and the only application they were apparently used for, although I haven't found much information on this, which was ostensibly military applications. By the nature of their design, this type of tube is more resistant to magnetic fields because since it decides which color is where based on feedback, when you distort the electron beam's path with a magnet, the pulses are still being sent back to the photosensors. So despite the fact the electron beam isn't landing quite where the circuitry expects it to be, the circuitry doesn't care because rather than guessing, it's relying on those pulses coming back from the photosensors to tell it which color to send out next. So sure, you're making the beam go faster or slower or curl itself around or whatever, but it's still tracing a path across the screen. So every time it hits an ultraviolet strip, the device starts putting out red. And every time it hits a green strip, the device starts putting out blue. It's a pretty neat trick. And if I'm ever able to secure myself a larger indextron so that I can show you this at a larger scale where you can maybe see it, I'll make sure I put up a video. I have a eBay save search for every single indextron product ever made. It is by far the coolest damn thing I've ever seen a CRT do. Any other tube I'd done that to, I would have had to get a tape demagnetizer out to try and get it back to something approaching normal. It's just a really cool party trick. Other than the magnet trick though, and the fact that it is technically rare and technically clever, um, like I said, there's not a whole lot to write home about. So I will just tell you a short story about this. I actually have two of these. I've got this one, and then I've got the one that came with this viewfinder, which was Hitachi branded, uh, that I picked up at a Goodwill for like $8 brought it home, plugged it in, didn't work. And when I looked at the front of the viewfinder, I saw color electronic viewfinder. And I thought that it meant color camera with an electronic viewfinder. It never occurred to me that the viewfinder itself might be color. So I just put it in a box and I stuck it in my storage unit and ignored it for like a year and a half. And then when I was doing inventory a couple weeks ago to see what cameras I had, I came across this one and I happened to Google it and saw something mentioned it at a color viewfinder. And I thought, no? Huh? I knew that couldn't be right because there was no technology that can make a viewfinder that small. So I dug it out, I brought it home again, I plugged it in, it still didn't work. And then I saw those humps in the bottom of the viewfinder and I thought, no, because at this point I'd heard about the Indextron. I knew what a beam index tube was. I just recently read about them for the first time. And so I thought there's only one way they could have done this, but it can't be that. I did not buy a beam index color tube and just throw it in my storage unit and forget about it for a year, broken or no. There's no way that happened, right? I did do that. I guess it just goes to show that there's value in Googling virtually anything you have. Looking it up on Internet Archive, looking it up in old magazines to find out what people wrote about it, because you never know what you're going to discover. After I discovered the other one didn't work, I went to eBay and looked up the RCA version of the same thing, and I found like six of them for like $40 a piece. So I just ordered one, hoping it worked, and it arrived, and it did work. So I'm glad I was able to demonstrate it for you. So that's all I had. It's not a very complex topic. Maybe I'll talk about the rest of the camera someday. I don't know. It's okay. It's kind of interesting. But the viewfinder, I think, is far more novel. So I figured I would tell you all about that. If you enjoyed this, it'd be cool if you could throw me a couple bucks on coffee or subscribe to my channel. Uh, any sort of feedback like that makes it a lot easier for me to stay motivated to keep making videos. Anyway, thanks for watching. Have a good one.